Our scripture reading is from the Gospel according to Luke. In chapter 22, I'll be starting the, first, the last two verses of chapter 21. Verse 37 leads into chapter 22 all the way to verse 13. We'll start with verse 37 of chapter 21. It says what Jesus was doing throughout that last week in Jerusalem. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple, and at night he went out and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. And all the people came early in the morning to him in the temple for to hear him. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. And he went his way and communed with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity to betray him unto them in the absence of the multitude. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And they said unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare? And he said unto them, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, Bearing a pitcher of water, follow him into the house where he entereth in. And ye shall say unto the goodman of the house, The master saith unto thee, Where is the guest chamber, where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? And he shall show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Thus far in the reading of God's holy and precious word. And before we, we do pray, let us also turn in the back of... We have arrived in our study of the gospel according to Luke at the very last part of the last week of Jesus' public ministry in this world, not only in Jerusalem, but in this whole world. We've been looking at the last week of the Lord Jesus for the last few chapters from chapter 19 on, and we, we saw how he had many things to teach and many things to do. He began by looking at Jerusalem following that triumphal entry and weeping um, at the thought that judgment would come upon that very people because of what they were about to do by the end of the week. The, the thought of the judgment that would befall them made the Lord Jesus, who is also the judge, to weep. He proceeded to cleanse the temple and reminded um, that the temple is to be a house of prayer, not a den of thieves. And later he even prophesied through a parable about his death and resurrection and that it would be the very leaders of the Jewish people, the religious leaders who would be the ones devising his death. He taught on the relation of God and government with that whole concept of, of what Caesar is worthy to receive and what is God's to be received. And then he also taught on the resurrection of the dead when the Sadducees posed that question challenging him. He referred also to his divinity in this last week. He warned the people about the self-centeredness and the greed of the scribes and also about the coming destruction of Jerusalem and the coming persecution to his people and the end of all things in the second coming of the Son of Man. Of himself. And all the while that, that all of this theological training has been happening, there were other things that were happening. He, he was being told by the people that he was supposed to, to make the people stop their praises to him, which he did not do. 
His authority was being questioned, which, which he ignored. Um, spies were coming to him, pretending to be interested in what he had to teach because they were trying to take hold of his words so that they might deliver him up to the power and authority of the government. And now we read in chapter 22 that they are ready to seek him and put him to death. And we will be looking at the sad reality that one of his own disciples chooses to betray the Lord Jesus, giving the desire of the Jewish leaders to find an opportune time to arrest him. And in the midst of, of all of this, this theological training and this, um, this growing animosity towards him, the Passover is being prepared. And, and just think of, of what's happening to all of Jerusalem. It is full of people. Pilgrims have come from all over because of the Passover feast. And it's not only Jesus who is preparing the Passover. Every single family um, in, in Jerusalem is now preparing um, the Passover. It, it, it is millions of people who are there. They, they are preparing that lamb. They are preparing the unleavened bread. And they are preparing the bitter herbs. They are purchasing wine. They are making things ready for the Passover feast. And the Lord Jesus is here giving directions to his own disciples so that they would also celebrate the Passover. And what we see in this passage is a greater preparation still. Even when we start in our first point where we look at the preparation for betrayal, even though this, this whole section that speaks of Judas going and, and having this conspiracy with the scribes and with the Pharisees, with the chief priests, to, to hand Jesus over, this already begins what, what I mean about a greater preparation still. Because as we look at this passage from the, from the light of God's sovereignty, God is the one preparing the lamb for the Passover. He is preparing the very lamb of God. He's preparing the one that was the very, the, he is the true one that the little lamb from the days of Egypt where they had the lamb of the Passover all the way to this day, Every lamb that had been slaughtered and eaten in the house of the Israelites every year, remembering the deliverance from Egypt, those lambs were always pointing to this lamb, the Lord Jesus. And God is about to offer his lamb. So this is what I mean by Passover preparation, not just the preparation of all the people and not even the preparation of the apostles, the disciples, but the preparation of God. He is preparing the Passover lamb. And so let's look first at the preparation for betrayal. As we, as we see Judas, um, he finds a moment um, during, that, during that week, probably more towards the end of the week, um, as he understood that there was this interest um, in, the, in the mindset of the priests of the chief priests to, to have Jesus turned in. Um, I, I want to read a verse in John eleven fifty seven. We read this there. Now both the chief priests and the Pharisees had given a commandment that if any man knew where he were, he should show it that they might take him. That's John eleven fifty seven. It's probably a command that wasn't made um, um, in the public completely because it's the very public that they were scared of. But they probably told their, their inner people, the ones who they knew that they could trust, that this is a command set forth. If you find Jesus away from the multitude, come and tell us. It was a command. It wasn't a suggestion. And so it's possible that Judas caught wind of this. He obviously understood there were people who hated Jesus and he is ready to betray him. And he makes a promise. It, and it, they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And he promised and sought opportunity. Promise means to give one's honor. He, he was making a pledge. 
He has been following Jesus for three years, but now at the very end, he makes a pledge to turn Jesus in. And this sought opportunity means to, to, to find a favorable time, a, a fitting time. Now, here we have the question, how could there ever be a fitting time to betray your own Savior? If you, if you get into the mind of Judas and you wonder, how could he ever conjecture, think that there could be such a time. Well, physically speaking and logically speaking, it would be a time without a crowd. It would probably be either at night or early in the morning whenever Jesus would not be around the people. This is why I began reading in, in verse 38. Um, 37 says how Jesus in the daytime was teaching. There's a lot of multitude around him. It was, it was more than the normal multitude because it was Passover. The temple would be packed full of people and Jesus was, was teaching. But then in verse 38 it says, And all the people came, excuse me, verse 37, and abode in the mount that is called the Mount of Olives. So at night he would retire to the Mount of Olives. And then that's where the Garden of Gethsemane is. That, that explains very clearly why that's where we find Judas the next time betraying Jesus. See, he understood this pattern of Jesus and he knew there would be those moments. Um, verse 38 says, And all the people came early in the morning again to the temple. So that would be a, not an opportune time. And so Judas was waiting for this fitting time. But the fitting time to betray your Savior, the one who protected you for three years, who taught you, who loved you, who fed you. We, we find passages in the Bible that would indicate that, that Jesus' relationship to, to Judas was, was a good one. Even when we look at Psalm 41.9, which is a prophecy about this betrayal, it says, Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, hath lifted up his seal against me. Now, it could be that Jesus, even in his knowing that this would be the betrayer, he would have never seen him as a friend, that he would always keep him at a hand's distance, as it were. But the very prophecy says that there was, there was an element of a closeness to him. He was a familiar friend. He was one in whom he trusted, one with whom he ate his bread. And Judas was one of the twelve, so he would have been one who would be sent when they were sent two by two, and when they did miracles, when they made it, whereby demons would be the people would be delivered from the demons. And, and when they came back and said to Jesus, full of excitement, what they saw, he would have been one of those who would have seen those very things. He was a preacher of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, a preacher of the kingdom. And possibly this trust in whom I trusted is the reality that he was entrusted with being the treasure of the whole group. And that in many ways was his very downfall. But he was trusted. He was a friend. He was with Jesus. Jesus was his master, his Lord. You know, however valuable that kind of master to you would be, is that how you decide the price if you were to sell him? If he is so valuable, then you don't sell him. But you see what happened to Judas. Let's, let's stop to ask this question. Why did Judas betray Jesus? And, and, and it is not um, something that we're left in ignorance. We, we can put things together because of what we read in God's word. It's, in, 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 in some general way, it's obvious that Jesus failed to be the Messiah that he, Judas, thought he was supposed to be. Um, he saw no might. He saw no armies. He saw no political prowess. And now he's even declaring the destruction of Jerusalem. I thought we would rule with him in Jerusalem. But he's making it clear that this city will be gone and lost. And no glorious temple? That's, that's like the symbol of the power of all of Israel. And his, he's declaring the destruction of this various place. So of course there will be no glorious palace and no glorious throne and no right or left or anywhere nearby him to sit. 
Now, Matthew has another clue because in Matthew we read right connected to just before Judas going and betraying is that little portion where the woman comes that that breaks that alabaster box of very precious ointment on the head of Jesus. And we hear the disciples full of indignation and they called it a waste. And in the Gospel of John, we have reason to believe that it's the same event that's recorded, just in a little different order, that it would have been Judas who would have said, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? And John adds, this he said not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. And you see how Judas was very, very keen in the value of things. And he's putting things together. This man has declared that our capital city will be destroyed. Our capital symbol will be destroyed. And what's worse, this whole event where he has no value for what is so very valuable, he says that that woman was anointing him for his death. He's going to die. Why serve him? Maybe I'll have some profit if I take the offer of these chief priests while he's alive. He may be worth at least 30 pieces of silver for me. So when you put all of that together, we see that he was covetous for position and covetous for profit. He was disobeying what Jesus said in Luke 12, 15. Take heed and beware of covetousness. But that's who Judas was. Covet, he, covetous. He, he, was, he was going contrary to the very warning of, of Paul in 1 Timothy 4.10. The love of money is a root of all evil. Notice how Paul puts it there. Not the root of some evil, but the root of all evil. And, and the love of money is, of course, put here in a, in a symbolic way. When you might find someone who's not so much desiring money in itself or maybe even cash, but he's so covetous for, for things or for positions or for power or for fame. And, and it is a covetousness. And it is the root of all evil. And beloved, we, we have here really what is a Gigantic, solemn warning before our hearts because we literally have the example here of, of the greatest sin that could ever be committed in terms of betrayal, to betray Jesus. This is cosmic sin, as every sin is. But this man was selling his only Savior and a Savior whom he knew. He knew better than the multitudes. And the Bible has examples of, of covetousness, but this is the greatest. It's the most evil, greatest in that sense. It is the darkest and the most evil. We, we have the examples of Divas who loved, Demas who loved this world. We think of Gehazi who went after the, the silver and the clothing. And, and we think of Ananias and Sapphira. But this is worse. Now, G, Demas, he left Paul, but Judas is leaving Jesus. Ananias and Sapphira, they desired some fame for themselves, that they were so charitable that they gave all the money when really it was only half. But Judas desired the death of another. Gehazi sold his honor when he lied, but Judas sold his Lord. And in selling the Lord Jesus, he was selling the best master, the best friend, the best man who's ever walked upon this earth. There was no one greater who could ever be betrayed against. And J.C. Ryle puts it in this way. He says, let us watch and pray against the love of money. It is a subtle disease and often far nearer to us than we suppose. A poor man is just as liable to it as a rich man. It is possible to love money without having it, and it is possible to have it without loving it. Let us be content with such things as we 
have. And it's J.C. Ryle who reminds us that this, this is the worst case scenario of coveting something. That's why Judas is called a son of perdition. Now, a few applications before we move to our second point. This is a warning to every believer, first of all, because this kind of sin in, 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 in face value can only be committed by one who professes faith. To betray the Lord Jesus, who's been your Lord and your, your professing um, um, Messiah, only for those who profess him as such. That's why every sin of a believer has a greater darkness to it than even the sin of an unbeliever. Because we are sinning against greater light. The unbeliever sins against a God whom he knows not as much as you do if you're saved. The unbeliever sins against a Jesus who is not his proclaimed Savior, nor is yet his Savior. Could be. He needs to trust and repent, but isn't yet. But you see, beloved, how this deepens the, the, the reality of the sin of a believer. As much as we know that our sins are there upon Jesus and we can say his righteousness is mine, but this never negates the reality, beloved, that we must put our faces to the ground when we sin with the reality that I have sinned against my master and Lord, just like Judas, in a sense, did, because I'm, I'm sinning against the one who gave me love, who gave me his life, and I know it. I have professed that I know him, and I have sinned against the one that I know. I am his familiar friend. I'm the one whom, in a sense, he's trusted me. He's chosen me. I'm, I'm living for him, but then I sin against him. So every sin of a believer, we, we need to be in contrition. We need to ask the Lord, forgive me yet, Lord, for one more sin that has this betrayal face to it. But then there's a warning here, of course, to every human being. It, it, it does widen. It's not just a, a warning for the believer or for the professing believer. It really is a warning to every human because there's this reality. That this right here is a picture of every sin in every way. Because who are we? If, we? if we think of ourselves not just as believers and unbelievers, but as human beings created by God, see, we all have this in common. We all have the image of God impressed upon us. And, and everywhere we look and everything we have is a gift of God to us. God looks upon this humanity and he's literally saying, I love you. I give you water and I give you bread. I give you a mind and IQ. I give you hands and sight and I give you feet. I give you a capacity to have a degree and a home and children and family and a job. Every human, and, and, and if you think, of course, those who are living in great, great affliction, there's still blessings yet to them. The only place devoid of blessing is hell because that is judgment. But while we are upon this earth, there's a sun that shines, there is rain that falls, there is harvest to be had. And when a son of Adam and Eve sin, it is betrayal. It is betrayal of a God who loves you. And, and there's a sense where the more wicked a person is and God still gives them rain and he continues in his wickedness, that betrayal is even greater because, see, God is loving someone who's a murderer. And that murder is still alive, but not, does not acknowledge God. So that betrayal increases, you see. It's a greater sin still. Because God is loving still. And keeping him or her alive. Well, that only increases, of course, the guilt. But where are we safe? We are safe when we confess it. We are safe when we acknowledge, Lord, may the sin of Judas impress upon my heart that I need thy forgiveness. 
Cleanse me. Pardon me. And beloved, if, if you are not saved, you need Jesus right now. The, the first warning I gave does not make you, as an unbeliever, less of a betrayer. You're a betrayer still. Because the life you have, God gave you. If you sin against him and if you don't believe his Christ, it's a betrayal. You see how betrayal is really an emblem of sin. Every sin. Now let us go then to our, our, our second point. The preparation for the Passover. And, and as we look at this preparation for the Passover, there's a, there's a bridge here between the first portion and, and the next. This first portion is the betrayal of Judas. But how does this connect with, with verse 7 on where the Lord Jesus is, is sending the disciples to prepare for the Passover? Notice how it's connected. Even the reality of how Jesus sends them, which really if you count, if you look at the words Jesus uses, there are in essence three levels of encryption, you could say. Jesus was with all his disciples. Judas is there. He's already planned to betray Jesus. He's listening to everything Jesus says. But as Jesus says where to go, Judas will have absolutely no idea where that place is. He can't go tell anyone. So this is where we start seeing something so divine that is happening and beyond just the reality of human interaction. There was already a tip of this, not looking at the divine, but looking even at the devilish. Because as we read, when, when Judas is there going, it says in verse 3, Then entered Satan into Judas, surnamed Iscariot. And so we, we see that behind the scenes of this horrible scene of betrayal is the powers of darkness. And, and not just in any kind of way. This is the one place in the scripture that we hear of Satan entering a human. Not just a legion of devils or other lesser devils. They obviously seem to be in a hierarchy, some with greater or less power than others. But this is the Lord of them all. He enters Judas. No wonder this is the greatest of all betrayal that has ever happened. So we already see that there's something beyond just the earthly here. But, but yes, we see the powers of darkness, but we have to go above this and see that as, as we look at this and see that it's not just human, it's, it's also not just darkness. It is God's sovereignty overarching everything. And, and this is what's so precious, beloved, is, is seeing that even as God is allowing Satan to have his way and Judas is not protected anymore by his grace so that he can be even possessed by Satan, God is sovereignly in control of it all because see, he is preparing the Passover. And in God's ordaining grace, it would happen through this betrayal. And Jesus will have to go to the cross. And that is where the Lamb of God will give His life as a sacrifice for sinners. And so it is not these men who are glad, who now think they have the way to get Jesus, the chief priests and scribes and Judas and Satan. All these people are, are happy. But they're not the ones with an upper hand. It is God Almighty. And, and we begin to see this as we see this preparation for the Passover itself, where Jesus says in verse 10, Behold, when ye are entered into the city, there shall a man meet you, bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house where he enters in. Right there, there are two levels. Now you're going to meet a man with this sign. Follow the man into a home. And ye shall say unto the goodman of the house, that's a third level, you're meeting someone else in there and asking him a question. The master saith unto thee, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat the Passover with my disciples? We assume probably the guest chamber is in that very house, but we really have no idea. There's this reality that now there's a third level of encryption of where this place will be. And when we see this, is, is that it rises up to the level of heaven itself looking down upon this, where God is saying, I know Satan has risen against mine anointed. I know the kings and the rulers of this world are there shaking their, their chains as if they were enchained. They're enchained to their sins, not to me. But I have the upper hand. And the Lord's Supper will be calm. 
and protected. Judas will be there, but he'll be powerless. He can't tell where that place is. He can't leave just before it. That'll give him away. And when he does leave and starts the whole process, there will be time enough for all the upper room discourse that is recorded in John. God knew the schedule for the very minute because God's in control. See, this is what I want you, beloved, and me to see. God is preparing the Passover. It's not Judas. It's not the scribes. It's not even Satan. It's God. Well, in the second point, let's stop to meditate again about the Passover. And, and I know it's in most of your minds, but just to make sure, because this is integral to all that we're talking about. And, and beloved, and, and this is it's just so providential. We're not, we're not skipping to a different place in Scripture for this preparatory message. Next Lord's Day, we hope to have the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is completely established upon two things. Yes, the first thing is Christ and his death. But you see here, Christ and his death was on the very day and season of Passover. That's what they were celebrating. And so our minds have to go back to the first Passover to understand why that even existed to begin with. The Lord's Supper that we celebrate is, is always based on those two um, Happenings, the, the Passover itself, the deliverance from Egypt, and the Passover night that led to the death of Christ the next day. So let us just remember um, the, the main tenets of that, that Passover feast. Remember, boys and girls, that, that God's people had been in Egypt for 400 years. And for a great portion of the hundred last part years of the 400, not the beginning, but towards the end of the 400s, they had become slaves. And God had sent Moses. There had been the, the nine plagues. Pharaoh was still not letting them go. And God said, okay, now this is the night that will be the last night. And you are to have a lamb. Every family, if a family was small, join with another family and there would be a lamb. A lamb. The, the whole lamb had to be eaten. And it would be slaughtered and the blood of that lamb would be put on the doorposts. And the angel of the Lord would go by that night and whoever did not have the blood, the angel would pass through the home and the firstborn would die. Whoever had the blood, the angel would pass over. Now, that's why the name Passover. The name itself was remembering God's mercy because of the blood of the lamb. And that's why that lamb pointed to the Lord Jesus. That God's mercy on you is because of the blood of Jesus. And remember, think a little more. It wasn't just the lamb. They were supposed to eat it with unleavened bread. That first day of Passover began Seven days of celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It would go on and on. It was like a feast that kind of never ended. And, and it was unleavened bread that first day because they would the next day go out and start traveling. You wouldn't have time to wait for bread to rise, to bake. And they would eat bread without leaven. And leaven there was being an emblem of sin. And so the reality of repentance, but also the reality of forgiveness. Because of the Lamb dying, there is forgiveness of your sins. And as you trust the Lamb, you need to also say, I hate sin. Because that's what true trust is. It's not a second part of what brings salvation. It is what true faith is. We're going to see this a lot this evening as we consider our sermon, that faith and repentance are not two separate graces. They are connected because true faith is always penitent and true repentance is always believing. And so remember, they had to get rid of leaven. leaven. If, if it became a game for the Jewish family, they would go through the house. The father would, would hide little bags of leaven here and there. Children would find it take it outside and they would burn it. And that would be an emblem that any sin in our hearts, we need to mortify it. We need to throw it outside. It cannot live. But it's not that we repent and then God blesses you with forgiveness. Re repentance is, is a grace that God gives. And when you're truly saved, He makes you want to be holy. Mortifying sin. 
So the unleavened bread being those many days was communicating what, what we live today. Sanctification is not just what we learn when we are baptized or when we confess our faith. Sanctification is our whole life. Okay, so that's what they were preparing. They were going to find a lamb. They were going to get unleavened bread. They were going to get the bitter herbs. Remember the bitter herbs re reminded them of the bitterness of their slavery, but it was pointing also to the suffering of Christ that would be very bitter. And they had to procure wine because they would drink the supper with wine. But let's then talk about the preparation. First, and, and it will be in, in closing, it will be just a sequence of preparations, and I pray that, that it would be applied to your heart in how we prepare in many ways the same way. First is the protection of the place. And just as they needed a place that was protected to celebrate that first Lord's Supper, it was the last Passover and it was the first Lord's Supper, so do you and me, we need to have this place protected. How do they have to protect it? They needed to protect it from the incursion of the result of the betrayer. And notice that the betrayer was welcomed. That's what's astonishing. It's interesting reading from, from Matthew Henry. He puts it this way. Jesus knew the sin of Judas, but it had not become a, an open scandal. So in a judgment of charity sort of way, he was admitted to partake of the wine and the bread. And if it had already been public, he wouldn't have. That, that's kind of how Matthew Henry puts it. But see, Judas had his hands tied. And the chief priests couldn't barge in and stop it all. And, and the scribes weren't able to invade that place. And so they were able to have a place that was safe. And so think of it, beloved. We hope to partake of the Lord's Supper next Lord's Day. There are so many invasions that can happen. If you're sitting around the table, or even before you come, there may be the invasions of enemies called sin. You will be reminded of your sins. Satan will be the last one who wants you to be here. And he will be making you feel guilty for sins that you've committed. Perhaps sins that you have even asked forgiveness, but half-heartedly. And he'll remind you of how half-heartedly that was. He'll remind you of things even in God's word that are true, but are misplaced. Because he's going to try to not let this be a protected place for you. So you need to prepare your heart. Jesus protected that first Lord's Supper. Next Lord's Day, this needs to be a protected place. And, and the only place that you go to protect it is to the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask Him to forgive you of all your sins. Ask Him even to remind you of all your sins. But pleading for the grace of forgiveness and cleansing. And when the temptations may come, you simply flee to Christ again. Because if you're in Christ, you are welcomed at the table. There will be other distractions. You might be remembering the busyness of the following week. You might be remembering things that you need to do. And, and, and you will, your, your mind will be scattered all around. And those are things that you need to protect yourself against. Don't let those things come. Perhaps this whole week, make sure that things of the following week are done where they won't be a distraction for you, where you will come to the Lord's table not worried about the things of the future because you're trusting the God who is in control of all things. Whatever it takes, protect the place. And the main thing, of course, is by protecting your heart making sure your faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
not in your sins. And if it is in your sins, flee to the Lord Jesus for the very cleansing of it. Not in the distractions. And if it is, ask the Lord to give you grace to not be worried about those things. Tomorrow will, will, will take care of itself. And know that God is in control of it all. Just remember what Jesus did for you as a sinner and be grateful for it that you may partake. So don't allow the place to be run over, as it were, by invaders, as that's what Jesus was protecting that place. But then their preparation was to go and purchase a lamb. We, we don't read of them doing that, but this is exactly what they were doing. Look at verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And then verse 13, see this whole portion is about this. Verse 13 says, And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. So the place is already protected. Judas will have no power to devastate that last Lord's Supper, that last Passover. Um, but they need to prepare the meal. They need to prepare the meal. And the first thing, the most important thing, is the lamb. And so these very apostles had to go somewhere and get a little lamb. And just put this together, how, how astonishing this would have been. Of course, Jesus is now 33-some years old, and he's been eating the Passover lamb for this long. But this will be the last time that Jesus will be in a room where there will be a lamb that was roasted that they're supposed to eat, remembering the deliverance from Egypt and pointing to the deliverance of all of God's people. And that is Jesus himself. Can you imagine? Passover meals for Jesus must have been one of the hardest and yet most blessed feasts because he looked upon an animal that was roasted and eaten and he knew it pointed to him. He knew it pointed to the reality that he would one day be on the cross as a fulfillment of that lamb. And, and part of what they prepared was that lamb with the bitter herbs. So Jesus would be at those feasts, eating the bitter herbs with the unleavened bread. The bread would make him think, they will have no sin because of what I will do. But it will be bitter for me to do this. I will suffer greatly. You see, beloved, it's, it's after this that Jesus goes to Gethsemane and weeps and sheds drops of blood in his sweat. The Lord's Supper for Jesus was full of agony in a very pointed way because he was seeing a picture of his suffering. He was seeing a picture of the bitterness of the cross, of how it would be like roasting as a burnt offering. And yet at the same time, he knew it would feed his people so that they would live and be holy without leaven of sin, as that bread was an emblem of. So, beloved, this is how you have to prepare. None of us have to purchase a lamb because we're looking to Jesus. And, and we don't have to add unleavened bread and we don't have to add a bitter herbs. In the Lord's Supper, we will have bread that will point to his body, but, but we don't have to go and buy it. We, we have to, through this week, have this preparation in the spiritual sins. Be looking to Christ. Meditate, beloved. Perhaps this whole week would be the best thing to meditate upon the suffering and death of Jesus. When you think of the bitterness, think of the roasted lamb. Think of the blood on the doorposts. And I, I heard it in a message once about that blood, the blood of Jesus being in the doorposts of our soul. That's truly what saves you. It is not now a physical blood that will be anywhere, but it is in a spiritual sense, and it will be in the very doorposts of your soul so that when God's wrath comes, it will pass over you and not through you because you trust the sacrifice of Jesus. So we don't have to buy anything we shouldn't. We're not supposed to buy anything. We're not supposed to think of it in a physical way. Only those people preparing the Lord's Supper will, yes, bring wine and they will bring the bread and 
You wonder how often as these um, volunteers are holding that bottle of wine or holding that bread are thinking, this will be an emblem of the body of Jesus. But you have this week, beloved, to prepare and think of these things so that when you come to the Lord's Supper, you're, you're prepared. You're realizing what that blood means. You're realizing what that wine means, what that wine means and what that bread means. And your heart is full of gratitude for Jesus. You have confessed your sins and you'll continue confessing them. And knowing that it's, it's not even the amount of my confession, of course, that makes me forgiven. But I want to confess because I hate my sin. And I am so thankful for his grace that flows to me. Are you prepared? See, maybe you have professed your faith one day. But if you don't possess Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you still don't have the Lamb. And you don't understand the bitterness of His suffering. And you also don't understand the need for holiness. An unbeliever, by definition, is someone who has not truly repented of his sins or doesn't want to. So someone saying, I don't need unleavened bread. I don't care for the roasted lamb. I don't care for the bitterness of Jesus on the cross. Some people think that just because they profess their faith one day, they can be here. But beloved, if you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior, this is where self-discipline comes in. We are not barring you. We don't know what goes on in your heart, but you do. But this does not mean stay away. The Lord is saying, come to me. Be prepared. Trust in the Savior. Believe in Him. Repent of your sins. And if you have professed before God's people and the Lord, you are welcome at this table. It's another way, of course, to be prepared in the room that your heart is right with the Lord. And be prepared with praise. Now, I end here. Think of that, Lord, that, that Passover. It was full of thoughts of the deliverance from Egypt. It, it had been 1,500 years, and yet they, they remembered so vividly. Think of how you and I remember so vividly. Boys and girls, don't you think of that Red Sea, and it's kind of like a picture in your mind, the people leaving Egypt, and you think of life in Egypt and the sadness that it was and how hard it was to live there. Well, they, they were 2,000 years closer to that event, it was still 1,500 years before them. But in that night that they were celebrating with the Lamb, they were rejoicing in the deliverance from Egypt. And this is how you and I prepare also for next Lord's Supper. There's all this reality of remembering our sins and contrition and the suffering of Christ. And that's what breaks our heart all the more. But it's mixed with the joy of deliverance. That because Jesus suffered as he did, we know we are no longer in the Egypt of sin, in the darkness and bondage of sin. We have been delivered. And we are now on the road to the promised land, which is heaven itself. That's also how they were preparing. They were remembering the, 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 the stories of old. And there would be a moment where the father in the house would, would remind them of the very story of Moses and the ten plagues and the deliverance and, and, and the opening of the Red Sea. And so Jesus was also with that in his mind. And, and it should be in our minds as well. But what Jesus did on the cross was a greater salvation still than that one of old. He does not part the Red Sea. He parts death itself. So beloved, think of it this way. We are here in this world. The wages of sin is death. But if you believe in the Lord Jesus, even when you die, it is as if death opens as it were. And it has no long the sting and it has no long the power. And you walk as it were through dry land and death doesn't really touch you. So that Jesus even calls the death of a believer asleep. The second death is really what's cruel and horrific. And a Christian will not receive it. 
You could almost think of it as one side is death and one side is the second death and, and you're just walking right through. Your body will rest. Your soul will be with Jesus when you die. That's why when persecution comes to the church, we need to be so encouraged. Yes, even if they do the worst and they kill me, I will be in the safest place ever from there on because I'll be with Jesus. My body will rest, but my soul will rejoice, waiting for the resurrection of the body. Beloved, when you think of the parting of the Red Sea, think of the parting of death itself. Sin breaking its bondage. There's no more sin that could hold you back and send you to hell because Jesus died on the cross. Prepare your soul for next Lord's Day with these preparations. And may God give you grace to look to Jesus. May you have him as your Savior. It's the best preparation and only preparation to begin with. Let us pray. Our gracious and glorious God Almighty, we thank Thee, Lord, for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank Thee, Lord, that even in the midst of all of this turmoil after Him to kill Him, He could think, Lord, of loving us, of loving His disciples. We know, Lord, that that evening He also washed His disciples' feet, even as He's Speaking of the Lord's Supper and delivering the bread and the wine, he speaks of how one will betray him that very night. Lord, to think of the agony of Christ in the midst of this celebration. And it reminds us, Lord, even of our own Lord's Suppers, where it truly brings an agony when we think of our sins, Lord, our betrayals, our transgressions. And, and yet, on the other hand, we also are full of gratitude, full of joy, full of praise. Lord, help us to know of something of this blessed mixture and that it would be truly a balance, that we would not um, be so convicted of our sins, that we would have no joy. And let us also, Lord, not just think of the joy where, where we minimize our sins and what Jesus suffered for us, but that we would truly, by thy grace, be able to weep and rejoice, that our hearts would be prepared to sit at the table by thy grace, by thy love, Help us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll be singing now Psalter 108, um, stanzas 1 through 4. And our doxology will be 197.